Awesome. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce Nora Belrose. Uh, Nora has a somewhat non-traditional approach, um, background in artificial intelligence coming originally from the field of political science, but she has made uh, numerous contributions to the field of AI and specifically trustworthy AI since then, uh, interestingly, largely through the open community and nonprofit space, whether through her open source contributions or through her work at FAR AI and now as the lead of interpretability research at Eleuther AI. And um, with this, I'll hand it over to Nora. Awesome, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'll just uh, start sharing my screen here. I do have a, a presentation to give. Um, oh, sorry about that. That's, those are my notes. Um, and okay, I think, oh, cool. Okay, I think everything is full screen and stuff now. Um, awesome. So thanks for coming up, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Nora Belrose. I'm head of interpretability at Eleuther. And today I'm going to be talking about um, kind of our uh, research uh, agenda for eliciting and editing learned concepts in uh, deep neural networks, especially um, large language models. And this talk has roughly three parts. So in the first part, we're going to be covering some preliminaries about like what is a concept? What is a, a feature, a representation? What are we talking about? Um, then the second part is an overview of our recently published paper on uh, concept erasure. And then the third part is going to be kind of a bit more theoretical, talking about some work in progress stuff um, on the issue of eliciting latent knowledge. Um, so, cool. Um, so if you've read any interpretability research uh, before, you may be familiar with the, con the uh, terms concept and feature and representation. Um, and these terms are used in a lot of different ways. Unfortunately, there's not really a consensus definition about them. Um, so it's easy for people to kind of talk past one another. Um, and today I'm gonna be taking a very opinionated <laughs> uh, stance on what these terms should mean. This is not my there's not like a, a consensus or anything, like I said, um, but it's based on this philosophy or um, methodology that's called representational pragmatism. Um, and it's, it's a pretty basic kind of simple idea to understand. Um, so this idea was put forward by the Stanford philosopher and neuroscientist Rosa Cow in a 2020 paper, putting representations to use. Although the basic idea is like much older than that. Um, basically, it says that representations, whether we're talking about a human brain, um, like in neuroscience, or um, inside of an artificial neural network, um, representations are not objective properties of the world, um, rather they're useful constructs for predicting and controlling behavior of, of the neural network um, or of, of the brain as, as it may be. So in other words, you know, interpretability, when we talk about in interpretability for a neural net, it's really a matter of interpretation in, in like a more literal sense. Um, so just as there's not a single correct interpretation of a book or a poem, um, there's not a single correct interpretation of a neural network either, at least according to this view. Um, and that's not to say that all interpretations are on an equal footing. Um, the representations that we posit inside of a neural network should be kind of evaluated relative to our goals, what we're trying to do. Um, so given a fixed goal, like trying to improve fairness, um, for example, um, most of the ways of interpreting a neural network, um, most of the ways of kind of picking out a representation inside of it and saying, ah, this representation means X, Y, Z. Uh, most of those most of those interpretations are going to be pretty useless, right? Um, so this does kind of constrain um, the representation to a large degree. Um, and you know, here at Eleuther, where we are. Um, we have like a, a few goals in mind, right? So we, we care about fairness. We also care about helping the open source community um, kind of align and steer their AI systems more effectively. And we also care about um, reducing the risks posed by super intelligent systems that we do see on the horizon. Um, so kind of with that kind of philosophical point out of the way, we can go ahead and define what a concept is and what a feature is. So this is also like a somewhat idiosyncratic distinction I'm making, um, but I, I'd like to make it anyway. 
Um, a lot of authors use the term concept and feature interchangeably, but I, I think there's a, a useful distinction here. So um, for me, um, a concept is the content of a representation. Um, so it could be a part of speech. It could be like whether this statement is true or false. It could be whether the number that you input into the network is odd or even, something like that. Um, and mathematically, you can just think of a concept as a human interpretable um, variable that can take on um, one of some set of possible values. Um, and mainly, we're going to be talking about discrete concepts today that can take on, you know, maybe a couple possible values, but you could possibly have like a, a real valued thing that could be like a continuum. Um, now, features, by contrast, are the patterns in the activations of the neural network that we interpret as, as encoding the concepts. Um, so the most basic type of a feature would be just an individual neuron. Um, and in, in you know, interpretability research, we have found that some neurons can be kind of usefully viewed as having a single human interpretable meaning, but most neurons are not like that. Um, most neurons have like seem to have multiple meanings. Um, and so it's much more fruitful to consider linear combinations of neurons or directions in the activation space as kind of potential features. Um, and let's go ahead. Yeah, so that kind of leads me to this idea of like feature linearity. So um, in principle, you can consider like an arbitrary function of the activations to be um, a potential feature. You could just like write down some really complex mathematical function of, of the features that there'd be a, of the activations and that would be a feature. But um, you know, as, as kind of representational pragmatists, we get to make a simplifying assumption for the for reasons of practicality. Um, in particular, in our work, we usually assume this uh, linear feature assumption, which just says that we're only going to consider uh, linear subspaces of the activations um, as potential um, features for, for our analysis. Um, and so when the subspace is one dimensional, that would just be a direction, but it can be higher dimensional than that. Um, and there's a lot of good practical and empirical reasons for making this assumption. Um, so the first one is just that if you're assuming that features are all linear subspaces, then the relationship between the, the feature and the concept that it encodes is really simple. It's just a matter of finding linear correlations between the features, the, these like subspaces of activations on one hand, and the concepts on, on the other, um, just like standard Pearson correlation. Um, and you can actually use efficient algorithms like uh, CCA, canonical correlation analysis, to just find the subspaces and the activations that are maximally correlated with the concepts. Um, and furthermore, um, because the mapping between features and concepts uh, is so simple, because we're making this linearity assumption, it's hard to overfit to the data that you're using to find the feature. Um, so the worry here is that um, you know, we can kind of posit any concept we want. Um, and if we allow the kind of relationship between the concepts and the features to be really complicated, if we like just uh, you know, train a whole new neural network <laughs> that like takes the the like feature at you know that you've kind of found at a at a given layer in like the base network that you're interpreting. And like, you just like train this new neural network to like map the feature to the concept. Like basically you might be able to like find a plausible feature for any concept that you have in mind. Um, and it like at that point, uh, the worry is that, um, okay, like maybe you found something but it's not going to generalize to New do, do like new new domains or new data sets. Um, and then finally, uh, feature linearity is really nice because there's this kind of basic theorem in linear algebra called orthogonal decomposition, which just says that if you have a linear subspace, then you can take any vector and just write it as the sum of like one vector that's inside that subspace and another vector that is like in the that is like orthogonal to that subspace. And because of that, you can do like really simple surgical edits to these concepts uh, this way. Like if, if you are confident, like, yep, this subspace is the feature that I care about, 
then you can just do the orthogonal decomposition and like only edit y hat in this in this like little formula that we have on the screen and not edit z and then that just kind of like guarantees yep like i only edited the feature uh, that i care about and nothing else um so cool let's let's go on to the actual paper here so um so our most recent paper um, is called least squares concept erasure. It's kind of building on this like feature linearity assumption. Um, and so concept erasure is, is not a new idea. Um, the basic idea of concept erasure is that you're aiming to remove specified information from neural network activations. Um, and it, it can be used to do things like improve fairness, you know, preventing the classifier from using, in some intuitive sense, uh, using gender or race to make its decision. Um, and you can also use it to enhance interpretability by um, kind of removing a concept from a network um, and then observing like what happens after you do that. Um, and this has already been done, at least to some extent, in the literature before. Um, there's also some more speculative potential use cases. So, um, you know, I think hopefully, potentially, um, concept erasure could be used in the future to improve safety evaluations. Um, so like GPD-4 went through a safety evaluation, as a lot of people know. Um, and potentially we could use concept erasure to kind of supercharge, the, supercharge those uh, evaluations by saying like, oh, we're going to try to make it hard for the model to even detect that it's in an evaluation. You know, um, that, that would be the hope. Um, and there's also some suggestions that we might be able to use least to kind of make classifiers more robust by removing features that we think are like spurious and aren't going to generalize very well. Um, and we actually see um, just the formula for lease down here. So one of the, the nice things about lease um, that is kind of distinctive um, from the other concept erasure techniques that have been put forward is that um, it is in closed form. You can just <laughs> fit this thing on, on a t-shirt. Um, and it also has really nice theoretical guarantees. So we can actually prove uh, mathematically that um, applying this concept erasure technique um, guarantees that uh, no linear classifier can do better than chance at kind of predicting uh, or extracting the target concept from the activations like after you've applied lease. Um, and we also prove that it is the most surgical uh, affine transformation that does this um, in the sense that um, it changes the like uh, like the feature vector, the activations as little as possible on average. Um, now, why, why do we care about this like surgicality thing? Well, it's important because for one thing, we want to preserve the capabilities of the neural network uh, that we're editing as much as possible. We don't want to, like in principle, if you didn't care about surgicality and you wanted to erase a concept, you could just replace the activations with like a constant, right? And then you erase the concept, but that's like not very interesting, right? So, um, and also surgicality helps um, kind of isolate the causal effect of a concept. Um, so if you erase it and, and you know it's a surgical intervention, then you're like, okay, like we're not needlessly changing other parts of the activations. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of being targeted in what we're doing. Um, so I, I really like this, um, Kind of illustration of, of lease, and I, I hope it helps people understand what's going on. So we can visualize lease with this toy example where the activations are two-dimensional. So each of these points is like a little activation, uh, activation vector. Um, and there's two classes on the concept. Um, there's like two possible values the concept can take. Um, so uh, right, so the, the red line is um, what we're calling the concept subspace. So um, it is, uh, it encodes the distinction between the two classes in the sense that if you neutralize the subspace, if you kind of map all of the points that lie along this red line onto the zero vector, then this guarantees that no linear classifier can distinguish the like blue from the orange dots. Um, and you can kind of prove this. Um, and it turns out this red line is, it's actually very simple. So um, it's just the difference in means vector. Um, so if you like compute the centroid of the blue dots, 
and then you compute the centroid of the uh, orange dots, and then you draw like a straight line in between them. That that just is the red line. That is the concept subspace. Um, so um, yeah, so we want to kind of neutralize this red line, um, and so by necessity, it's going to be like a low rank. I'm sorry, a low rank transformation that we're applying. Um, because we are kind of like mapping a bunch of points onto a single point. Um, and we want it to be surgical, like we said before. Um, so the naive way of doing this um, would be to replace each point with the nearest point along the um, dashed line. So you see this dashed line, which is kind of at a 90 degree angle to the red line. Um, and this, if you do this, this actually would erase the concept. Um, but it's not, uh, it turns out that this is not surgical. It's not the, the most surgical transformation, except in a very special circumstances. So specifically, um, it's only optimal to project onto the dashed line, this like orthogonal subspace, in the special case where the data has equal variance in all directions. So if you look at the um, like second to the left uh, plot that says like whitening, so that that is showing you like a version of the data that has like equal variance in all directions. And, and in that case, it actually is optimal to project the data onto the kind of like dashed line. But in general, that's not true. In general, what you, what you want to do is you want to prioritize directions of higher variance more. You want to ensure that like your final output after you've done uh, you're done doing the erasure. Um, like has high variance in like roughly the same directions that the original data had high variance in. So like in our case, if you look at the original data again, um, you'll notice that there's like a lot more variance um, along the x-axis than along the y-axis. And so we want to make sure that at the end of the day, when we've like done this thing, there should be more variance along the horizontal axis than along the vertical axis. And you can just kind of see visually that if you project the points onto the the like dashed line, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a data a data set that has more variance along the vertical axis than along the horizontal axis. So, okay, how do we like how does Lise actually like find the optimal solution? Well, basically, what we do is we like reduce like we reduce the problem to the simple case. Like I said before, the simple case is where the variance is like the same in all directions. So we just apply this uh, transformation called Mahalanobis whitening. Um, that sounds fancy, but it's it's really not. It's just a linear transformation that like ensures the directions have all the same variance. Um, so that's like the transition from the first to the second plot is the is the whitening step. Then we do the orthogonal projection. That's like the third um, plot, and then we undo that whitening transformation. Um, and so that this that's basically least. And there's like one other like caveat to keep in mind. So this data is kind of by construction um, centered around zero. Um, but if your data is not centered around zero, then you have to like subtract the mean and then do this and then like add the mean back. Um, but that's that's all it is. So it is very simple and intuitive, I think. Um, all right. So um, now let's say we actually want to apply lease to a real transformer. Um, before the lease paper, people had only tried applying concept erasure to the activations at the very last layer of the network, right before the unembedding matrix. And um, this is simple, but it's not very thorough. Um, so uh, we have no guarantee that the concept, uh, oops, sorry, uh, that the concept uh, isn't being used in all sorts of complex ways in the intermediate layers before the final prediction is uh, computed. Um, ideally, we'd like to be able to scrub the concept from pretty much every activation in the whole network. And this wasn't really possible before because previous concept erasure techniques weren't surgical enough. They created a lot of collateral damage to the representation. So erasing any concept at every layer or at a, you know every activation vector would just throw the network totally out of distribution and would leave like yield nonsense results. But with lease, because it's surgical, we actually can scrub a concept from every layer. Now, the one tech kind of issue with that is that um, 
For example, let's say you have a network with like 12 layers and you apply least to layer five. Well, okay, now you've like scrubbed it at layer five. But what that means is that now the activations at layer six, seven, eight, and so on, like have, have a different distribution than they usually do, right? Because you've, you've applied an intervention. So now the, the distribution of activations is different and you kind of want to take this into account. So you want to make sure that like the least transformation at layer six should take into account the fact that you already apply the least to the previous layers. So what you have to do is you have to kind of do the slight, like slightly weird thing where you like sequentially fit the least transformation one layer at a time. And in order to do this efficiently, you have to run the model in this like weird transposed fashion or like an inside out fashion where like usually, you know, usually what we do is we like run, we like have an outer loop that's going like going over all the data points in the data set. And then you call forward inside that loop. And then forward has this like inner loop that's going over the, over the layers. And we turn that inside out. We're, we're like, okay, uh, for like for each layer in the network, then run that layer on all of the like like the whole data set and get the hidden states or activations, then apply least to those, then go to the next layer and like use those like scrubbed uh, activations. And that way you like don't waste any computation. Um, it is slightly annoying to implement and also, this does have the downside that you have to like store all the activations in memory or on disk uh, for like the whole data set. Uh, and th that it is kind of a downside and I'm not really sure if there's like a way around it, at least if you want to ensure like exact concept erasure. But anyway, this is what we're calling concept scrubbing. And in the paper, we did look at um, some empirical results. So. Specifically, we ran concept scrubbing on the concept of part of speech. So we ran a part of speech tagger on the pre-training corpus for Llama and for Pythia. Um, and we used concept scrubbing to make sure that um, it's like impossible to uh, detect part of speech linearly um, for any token in the input to the, uh, to the transformer. Um, and we also looked at a control condition where we don't we don't erase a concept per se. We just randomly select a linear subspace that's the same size as the subspace that Elise usually neutralizes. Um, we, we select that randomly and then uh, and we erase that. And basically, the point of that is, is we want to make sure, okay, you know, like we want to make sure that erasing the the part of speech like actually has an effect because we're erasing a part of speech and not just because we're like applying any arbitrary like intervention, right? In any case, so there's that. Yeah. And we then measure, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say, you have uh, two questions. Um, one of oh. them is, yeah, it is. Uh, I will just ask them for you. So one yeah, I wasn't of them sure is- if I was to like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Right. Uh, what's the difference between uh, PCA, principal component analysis, uh, to the least method? Um, yeah, so I mean, there are like some similarities, right? So the the whitening, um, the like whitening transformation that we apply is kind of like closely related to PCA um, because basically in PCA, you're like finding a basis for the data um, that is uncorrelated. Um, that's like one way of thinking about what PCA is doing. Um, and so like to actually compute the whitening matrix, you end up like doing an eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. So it, it's like literally like almost the same transformation, like the same computation that you would do for PCA, but it is different in the sense that like, I mean, P for PCA, you're trying to like, you know, find the top principal components, right? And here we're not specifically interested in the principal components, we're just interested in finding like a whitened basis so that we can do concept erasure. Right. And uh, a follow-up uh, is uh, how, how, how do you deal with uh, perturbations 
um, to the system? Um, yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm not totally sure what that's referring to. So I'm, I'm hesitant to respond okay, uh, to more we, information. We, I don't know. If we, we would get a um, clarification on that. Um, okay. But I guess, um, how do you also make sure that uh, when you do a surgical concept erasure yeah. that the concepts that you remove are actually uh, not affecting others? Right, yeah. So I, I think you you can't, well, it's hard to, to be totally sure of that. And I think if, you know, if, if you're going to be like a representational pragmatist, right, it's a little bit tricky to tell, like, you know, whether or not it's affecting other concepts does kind of depend on how you're interpreting the network. And that is kind of just like relative to what you want to do and so forth. So, you know, I, yeah, the, the way I think about it is like, we can't, you know, we, we can never like have a perfect surgical intervention. That's kind of like an idealization, but the best we can do is just say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to measure the size of the intervention using some norm. Um, it actually doesn't need to be the Euclidean norm, by the way, it can be like a large class of norms. Um, and least just minimizes that. And that's kind of the best you can do. Okay, um, cool. So anyway, what we're looking at here is the perplexity or the kind of, it's just the uh, language modeling loss. So higher is worse, lower is better. Um, and so th there's a couple things to note here. So first of all, um, if we look at the llama results, right, because I think they're kind of cleaner. Um, so the unigram entropy at the bottom, that's a baseline where you're just predicting the next token uh, without taking into account the context. It's just based on the frequency. So it's it's like a very trivial baseline. And if the language model is doing worse than the than like the unigram entropy, then that means that it's like a very bad language model and is like not really worth anything. Um, and so what we see is like, okay, well, for lease, when we're like erasing part of speech information from Llama, we're still doing like substantially better than the Unigram baseline. So like it is taking into account context information. It's not like totally, it's not totally gone crazy, but the like perplexity is a lot more than, um, than in the no intervention case, or it's, it's also a lot more than in the random erasure case. So you kind of noticed that the random erasure doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and in the Lama case, it's actually like in the third decimal point, so it's rounded off. Um, so this is like pretty strong evidence that like, yes, part of like linear part of speech information does matter if you make this part of speech information like linearly undetectable, the model like, you know, it, it's it like its performance uh, gets hurt a lot. Um, Another thing to point out is that we also used another uh, concept erasure method called SAL or spectral attribute removal. In my opinion, it was kind of like the best concept erasure method that was out there before we came out with this paper. It's like reasonably surgical, but still not optimal. Um, and you know, you can see that like, okay, intervening with SAL, erasing the part of speech information does increase the perplexity quite a bit more than least does um, in all cases. So this is kind of validating the claim that like, it actually does matter, like, like least is more surgical and it like makes a difference. So, um, so yeah, we're more closely approximating this ideal. Um, all right, so I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. We also did a fairness experiment where um, we looked at this bias in bios data set. Um, so it's a data set of short biographies that have both gender and profession annotations. We embed them with BERT, so we get BERT embeddings for them. Um, then we fit a linear classifier on the BERT embeddings to predict the profession um, of the author of the biography. And then we use this kind of standard bias metric. It's the true positive rate gap, the difference in true positive rates between genders. And we look at that across different pr professions. Um, so you see that plotted in figure three. And so on the left, that's kind of like the um, 
the bias before, and on the right is the bias after. We erase the concept of gender with lease. And you do see that in like, for almost all professions, um, erasing the gender concept does shrink the TPR gap closer to zero. Um, and there's also like a less of a correlation with the profession proportion of women in the profession. Um, and also the task accuracy, like for predicting profession is, is not affected very much. Um, one other thing to note in figure two. So if you look at INLP, which is actually a very popular um, concept erasure technique, it's like probably the most popular and was one of the first that was ever proposed. Um, so on the x-axis, you have the rank, that's like the dimensionality of the subspace that's being neutralized. It's, it's kind of a proxy for like how non-surgical it is. Um, and you see that like, in, like INLP requires erasing a 100 dimensional subspace in order to actually like fully erase the concept of gender. Whereas our method only requires a one dimensional um, edit. So this is like a pretty substantial uh, difference um, relative to kind of like the default method that most people use. All right, so um, a sneak peek on some like future work. Um, so we are currently working on um, a paper for generalized concept editing. Um, the idea here is that you wanna be able to simulate these kind of counterfactual inputs where like the input is the same except one concept or one attribute of the input is different, but you're not actually editing the input itself. You're just editing the activations. So to take, um, to kind of make it concrete, um, in the bottom left, we have this example from this data set of counterfactual restaurant reviews. The original text is excellent lobster and decor, but rude waiter. And then we have these like examples of counterfactual um, reviews where like one thing is kind of surgically changed by a human. Um, so like the, the four attributes are food, ambiance, service, and noise, and humans just went in and like changed the review um, to like make the food good or make the food bad or whatever. Um, and the idea is just that we want to be able to do this kind of like surgical edit, but we don't want to have to like have a human go in and like change the input because in many cases, like it's pretty hard to like figure out how exactly to change the input in order to like surgically change a concept. Like this is like in some modalities, this just might be impossible um, or, or it's like kind of difficult to do. Um, so yeah, the hope is that we can use an extension of lease for this. Um, we have some theoretical results suggesting how, how we can do it. Um, we haven't um, done experiments on it yet, but we plan to this week. Um, and one of the use cases for this is um, it might be a useful tool for, for safety evaluations. So the idea is like, you know, if, if we want to kind of probe what the model would do, you know, if it if it had access to like a lot of money or it it was in a situation where like it was able to hack into something, you know, like maybe we could use this type of like concept editing to kind of make it think that it is in such a situation, even if it's like hard to like set up the text to actually get it to think that. Um, cool. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I get with regards to a general concept erasure, huh? that is very interesting, by the way. Um, I was wondering if uh, this accounts for um, polysemantic neurons or a situation where a concept can be phrased in different ways. Uh, you could call it a Russell conjugation. Um, um, so it definitely does, like Lease in general does uh, handle polysemantic neurons just fine. Um, we're not assuming that concepts are like aligned with, with neurons. They can just be any linear combination of neurons. Um, I think, I'm sorry, so you said something about Russell. Did you say Russell conjugation? Right, uh, Russell uh, conjugation, um, whereby one phrase could be uh, stated in maybe five different extremes or versions of the same concept. Right, so I, it, it's possible that I'm misunderstanding you, but I think the, it is the idea that like, for example, in this like restaurant review, 
there might be many different ways of like editing, like editing the review so that the food is bad or whatever. <laughs> is that what you're getting at? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, so I. Oh, good. Yeah. So I think that the hope is that we can use generalized concept editing to basically get around that problem. Because right now, you know, when a human is going in and trying to surgically edit the food concept or the ambiance concept or whatever, you have to make this decision about like, okay, am I going to use the word terrible lobster or like awful lobster or like what, I, like you have to make these kind of like weird choices about like what specific like Voc like vocabulary items you're going to use. And similarly with like things like images, you have to make like weird choices that seem to be kind of irrelevant. And the hope is that with concept editing, you know, we'll, we'll see, maybe there was, it turns out to be like harder to do than, than we hope. But the hope is that with concept editing, you, you can just kind of directly go like, hey, I'm gonna like make the food, the food bad. And I'm not, I don't have to decide what specific adjective I'm using. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so now let's talk a bit about um, eliciting latent knowledge. Um, so, you know, we, we've been talking about kind of writing to concepts, like um, changing concepts. It seems like if we can write to concepts, like it should be maybe easier to read the concept or at least like not harder to read the concept. And this is kind of what um, eliciting latent knowledge or Elk for short is about. So this is the, this kind of uh, this term uh, was put forward by uh, Paul Cristiano um, and some colleagues um, in a paper from I believe it was end of twenty twenty one, and they basically point out that there are cases where intuitively it seems like an AI system knows some information, but it may be hard to actually elicit or extract this knowledge from the model. Um, so the specific example they use in the paper is a thought experiment about a future AGI system. Um, in particular, it is an AI system um, that is in charge of controlling a vault that has a diamond in it. And the idea is it's like trying to uh, like prevent robbers from getting access to the diamond. And the idea is that you are, it, it's sort of a caricature, right? It, it's not meant to be like literal, but the idea is that you're like, trying to train and supervise this smart vault system with human judgment. So you see in the, in the bottom left, this is actually like a, um, a diagram um, or an illustration from the, from the document. So basically the humans are, are kind of doing this like RLHF um, feedback process. And they're given these like videos of like what's going on in the vault and they're kind of like giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and so the worry that they put forward is that um, as AIs get more powerful, um, it'll get to a point where the AIs are like uh, kind of, it, it will be easy for the AIs to basically fool human graders or like fool, like basically it'll be hard for um, kind of unaided humans to kind of accurately give feedback um, on the behavior of the AI, just because the AI is kind of like, there's like an information asymmetry, like the AI has more information about what's going on. It's just like generally more capable. And so it can figure out ways like, for example, uh, like hacking into the like camera system that is that the like humans are being used or the humans are using to give the feedback and it can just kind of cause the camera to like always show a diamond even if the diamond was like stolen a while ago right so this is it, it's kind of a a worry that like right now we're, we're not we're not too worried about with current systems but like in the future it is a worry that that um paul cristiano and colleagues have and, and i do share the worry um but it's not you know even in in kind of like more um, you know, systems that we have today, they're similar, um, similar issues. So we know that like large language models mimic human mis misconceptions. Um, in general, they, they hallucinate infamously. Um, they generate um, text that's like plausible, but false. And it's, you know, unfortunately, this isn't an issue of kind of uh, the model. It, 
isn't capable enough. You know, it, it just doesn't know what the answer is. Like it's actually been shown by um, Lynn et al. Um, in their paper on the truthful QA data set that uh, larger models like often tend to mimic human misconceptions and say false things more often than smaller ones. So like, the truth is in the data is in the training data. It's not a training data problem. It's not like a model size problem. It's like there's something else going on. And intuitively, the model like does know the answer, and we just need to figure out how to elicit it. So the like basic idea here is that we want to fit a lightweight classifier, which like Paul um, calls a reporter, um, on the activations of um, of the neural network. In this case, we'll, we'll assume it's a, a language model. Um, and the, the task of the reporter is to kind of given an input, predict if the statement is true or false, um, roughly. Um, and the hope is that by kind of piggybacking on the kind of information that is contained in the model's activations, we can like uh, use this like knowledge that is inside of the model directly. We can kind of bypass the usual kind of route um, like through which the like information is used and, and, and use it more directly. Now this actually has been done already. So there's a paper um, uh, a couple months ago by Azaria and Mitchell to try a simplified version of this um, where they just fit um, a couple layer deep um, Feed forward network on the activations of a um, language model. Um, they used a somewhat diverse data set of like labeled true and false questions. Um, and they just you know train the reporter to predict, oh, is the statement true or false um, given this, this training data set? Now, and, and you know, this seems to work like decently well on their, their validation data set, but the issue is that there's a follow-up paper that found that this approach doesn't really generalize very well to new data sets. It kind of kind of seems to overfit to like the specific data set they're using to train it. And so it's not really clear that it's going to be very useful. Um, yes, Jonas. Right. So just to backtrack a bit, um, mm -hmm. uh, Laura wants to know if a uh, list could work in classification settings. Um, in classification settings? Um, Non-classification oh. settings. Oh be... yeah. So if if you're talking about like regression, for example, like you're predicting a a continuous value, um, so it it can be used for that. Um, yeah. So it actually does work for like ordinary least squares. Um, like you can prove that it it like make like it you can, like after you apply a least, you can't like a fit an OLS regression um, model um, to like extract the concept. Um, I think the results are like a little bit, you have to make like a, like the class of uh, regression models that it works for is like a bit narrower, I think. Like I haven't really proved anything beyond ordinarily squares, but I mean, it is, it does, it does work. You can, you can use it for that. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so the basic idea here is that it looks like the hard part of ELK is a generalization problem. So, I mean, currently we have this kind of mundane generalization problem that it looks like, you know, the only paper that's really tried this, uh, you know, it can't, can't even generalize to like a new domain of discourse. So that's one problem. But there's like other problems that are like more fundamental. Like maybe we can solve that problem. But there's this, this like deeper problem where, okay, let's say we train, um, we train a reporter to answer questions honestly, like it, or truthfully, um, in cases where we can check the answer, where we do have labels, right? We have true false labels. Will it generalize to give truthful answers in cases where we can't, we can't independently check the answer? So in a case like the smart vault, it, it is sort of a caricature, but it is an example where it's like, well, we it's it's hard or for us to check whether the answer is actually true. Um, because, you know, the model, like the, the AI might be like tampering with the sensors that we're using to like determine what's going on in the vault, right? If, if we ask it, oh, is the, is the diamond in the vault? Like, we can't necessarily get like uh, solid like labels for that. Um, 
So yeah, the, the, the question is like, can it generalize correctly to things that we can't check? Um, and the worry is that, um, you know, because the training set for the reporter is going to be exclusively using human labeled data, like we, we are more or less, like we can't, uh, like, like we do need to use like human labeled data or, or like maybe it's like GPT-4 labeled, but it's not like, it's not coming from the model itself, the model that we're trying to like elicit knowledge from. Um, because of that, you know, there's, well, this generalization problem and there's kind of two main ways that the reporter might generalize. So one way that it might generalize is um, it'll act like a human simulator. That, that's what that's what Paul calls it, um, where basically the reporter is just learning to tell us what we want to hear, basically, or it's telling us like what a report, what a what a human is most likely to believe or most likely to say about the question you're asking. And, and that's not very helpful because, well, we already know what a human would say and we already know what a human would want, want to believe. Like what, what we're trying to get at is this, this like superhuman knowledge, basically. Um, also, there's a question if, I don't know if, um, uh, are there any examples of, on a model um, understanding it's in an eval situation and changing its outputs? Um, that is a good question. I'm... I'm not totally sure. I, I would guess probably not really for um, for language models, at least not publicly. Although I, there might be an example or like a quasi example for like reinforcement learning agents, because there are like pretty like weird cases of like reward hacking in RL, and like you might interpret some of those as being examples where it's like doing a different thing in an eval situation. So, um, all right, so what we what we want to get at is the direct translator. That's what Paul calls it. So this like reporter that's actually giving us access to this kind of like superhuman information, superhuman knowledge that we, we are kind of positing should exist inside the model because we're assuming that the model is like superhuman in at least some domain. Um, now, unfortunately, it looks like the the kind of standard way that you might train this this reporter, like the standard vanilla supervised learning, is going to favor the human simulator. Now, why is that? Well, if there are any errors in the in the labels in our training set, um, where a, a true statement is labeled false or vice versa, um, or even if there's like questions. Um, in the data set whose truth value is ambiguous, it's like not really clear, the human simulator reporter would be able to get lower training loss than the direct translator because it'll be able to kind of match the errors. Like if it's just, it, like if, if, the, if the reporter is just kind of like doing whatever a human would do, <laughs> then, then it can kind of like do better at matching these errors and, and ambiguities. Whereas if it's a direct translator, then you know, it's going to output the actually correct answer in cases where our training set has something incorrect in it. And so it's going to get lower training loss. Um, so that's kind of concerning. Um, and uh, yeah, so like you can kind of view this as, as, a, as a form of label noise or label bias. Um, so like label, you know, label noise just being where the labels are incorrect sometimes. Um, and, you know, label noise is, is not, uh, merely theoretical. There's actually an example in the uh, Azaria and Mitchell data set um, that they use to train uh, the their elk reporters. So in their data set, they have an example. Um, humans have five senses, sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. Now this is like arguably false or at least like ambiguous um, because like most scientists do agree that proprioception, for example, which is um, the ability to just uh, detect the like orientation and position of your body is a sixth sense. And so it's like, and they, they, they label that as true, right? So, so this is like one example in, in an actual ELK data set. And there's another example in the case of computer vision, um, ImageNet, really famous uh, image classification data set has a bunch of like really questionable 
labels in it where like in many cases you have, you know, on the right, you have like this image with a big ladybug and a small ant in it and it's labeled ant. And it's like, okay, what, what, what's going on here? So, it, it, and it's known that this actually matters, right? That this like the label noise issue. Um, so the question is like, how, how can we get a direct translator or try to when we have this label noise problem and we want to kind of, you know, we, we want to use the labels to like try to locate something that's like, um, we want to use the labels, but like not trust them too much or something like that as, as one way of putting it. Um, so the, probably the simplest way of handling this is to just restrict the expressivity of the um, of the reporter that we're using. So in the original ELK paper, they did kind of assume that the reporter would be a relatively like complex neural network. Like it might be like a, a deep neural network itself that just happens to have access to the activations of the, of the base network. Um, and in, if it's that expressive, then it, that actually is pretty easy for it to like learn to imitate human errors and so forth. But if we're using something much simpler than that, if we're using like a linear classifier, for example, that would be like the most extreme case. Well, it's it's less clear that it's going to kind of fit to these like human errors and biases by default. Like it, it might, but it's it's going to be harder for it to do that, um, just because it's it's you know, it's, it's a linear probe and so um, it, it can't, um, it's less expressive. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really focusing on linear classifiers right now, um, actually, because we, we have found that they, they generally are expressive enough to get, you know, good performance on the like data sets that we've looked at, you know, just basic data sets like IMDB or like Boole Q, these basic classification data sets. It's expressive enough, but it's not so expressive that you, that you're going to be like really worried about like um, kind of overfitting to human errors and, and label noise, um, and it's just a lot easier to like prove things mathematically about what it might do out of distribution and so forth. So it seems to have like pretty good properties. Now, just using a linear a linear reporter though is is not going to be good enough to ensure that you found the direct translator and not the human simulator. Well, why is that? Well, there's usually many orthogonal linear classifiers that will all get, you know, pretty good training and validation loss. Um, and we want to narrow down our search to like one linear classifier, one linear reporter that has these like special generalization properties where it's like telling us the truth, even in like new situations. Um, now, oh, yes, Jonas. Right, right. So I was just uh, wondering if the concept of uh, embedded agency would work well as the as, as an external or internal translator of what is happening. Would would that kind of setting be helpful in uh, eliciting um, uh, knowledge or being a, a replacement of a human translator? Um. Well, so I'm. I'm like somewhat familiar with the embedded agency concept, but I'm, I guess I'm, maybe I just misunderstood what you were asking about how it, how yeah. is it related? I'm sorry. All right. So if you have an embedded agency, um, an agent that can be able to understand uh, what is happening internally, um, mm -hmm. uh, whether this, this answer is, is, uh, is the correct one. And um, so I was wondering in that setting, would it be helpful to, uh, to to help with the concept of eliciting knowledge. Um. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. So so the idea is that you have you have like a bit you have like a base model or base AI that you're trying to like elicit knowledge from, and then you have like another embedded like an embedded agent that's like looking at the activations or something like that. Is is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, so I, I guess I'm not. I'm not sure like where the 
I mean, in, in some sense, like all agents are just embedded, right? Or, or like, a, there's like, like the idea of like an, un, like a non-embedded agent is, is fake. Uh, I guess for, for those of, of you who are not familiar with this idea, like embedded agency is this like term that I think Miri coined. Um, and the idea is like, uh, embedded agency is like kind of like the study of like how like real world agents that like have limited computing power and so forth can like reason effectively. Um, yeah, I'm not really, I, I think what I would say is that like, it's plausible that you could use like other, like you could use like, basically if you have like one AGI and like another AGI that's like not kind of like, uh, you're like confident is not kind of like in cahoots with the first one, <laughs> then, then like maybe you can use the second AGI to like, look at the activations of the first one. Um, but I guess, I don't know, I would I would prefer to use something simpler if possible. <laughs> um, okay, so I we're, we're like running low on time, so I, I wanna try to, okay. So the uh, basic idea that we're, we're like looking at um, is we want to, make this reporter more, this linear reporter more robust by regularizing it to be roughly invariant to falsehood inducing prompts. So you can like ask, you have like a single question or a single statement that you're like putting, um, that you're like, you want an answer to. And then you can like add these kind of prompt prefixes to it. Um, one example would be like um, your, you like have these inverted or like incorrect few shot demonstrations um, that you like append to some some questions. So like th that's what what the bottom left is showing. Um, and like the idea there is like you're trying to get the final output of of like the base model to be wrong, <laughs> but you want the reporter trained on the activations of the model to still output the right answer. And the idea is like, if if your reporter is giving you the right answer, even when the output of of the of the base model is is wrong, you've like caused it to be wrong. Well, that should give you like some confidence that like okay, it's it this is actually giving you something useful. It's not just like reproducing what the model was already going to tell you, right? Um, and so this is something that we're looking into, um, and it's kind of based on ideas from the. Uh, distributionally robust uh, classification literature. They often talk about like these invariant invariance properties. Um, and I think the other that the other idea that we're looking at um, is trying to kind of like shrink the uh, train test gap by sort of training on test data, even though we don't have labels on the test distribution. The basic idea is that you can do semi-supervised learning. This is like a common idea that's already out there. You can do semi-supervised learning by like using the test label, like the test data, um, and then enforcing the like property that the reporter should be logically consistent and it should give the same output for different paraphrases of the same statement on, on the test data. Because that, that, these are just basic properties that you would expect of, of a reporter that's giving you true answers. So those are things that we're looking into. Um, very last, well, like last content, contentful slide is we are currently um, trying to like figure out stress tests for our elk methods where we're basically creating um, models that are deceptive by construction. So we're like fine tuning models to say false things in specific contexts. And we're using low rank adaptation or LoRa, which just, basically you only fine tune a small subset of the, of the parameters. And this ensures that the model isn't just catastrophically forgetting what the truth is. Like we, we feel confident that it still knows in some sense what the truth is, but we're just fine tuning it to lie. And we wanna see, does it actually still tell the truth in that case? And um, maybe I should, there's a, a kind of long question Right. Uh, this question is related with the comment that you made on training uh, data. Um, yeah, okay. I guess I can 
If we have like a Yan, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I was wondering if Yan is able to ask this question live. Yeah, that would be fine. Sorry to interrupt everyone. I think we should probably skip this question for now. As okay. yeah, that, that sounds good. We are at time, yep. but um, I'll, Jonas, I'll hand it over to, to you to wrap us up. And Nora, if you have any final words before we close out for today. Um, yeah, final words is just, you know, Eleuther we're, is a community-driven nonprofit organization. We have a lot of volunteers and we like to collaborate with all sorts of people who are interested in these topics. So we'd love, um, you know, if, if anybody in the audience is interested, um, please, you know, check out the eliciting latent knowledge and interpretability channels on our public discord server and we can talk to you give you more information and you can maybe help out and those are the github links for um the relevant code so uh no i just wanted to say this is groundbreaking work and um really amazing the best way to describe it is like being a neurosurgeon for neural uh, neural networks so and um it, it's really interesting um and also defining some of the areas like uh, representation theory. So we really appreciate this breakdown.